Edwin approached Roman with news of the Hector kingdom's desire to align with the Demetris. Roman, unsurprised, remarked that he had anticipated this development. Edwin couldn't help but marvel at Roman's foreknowledge, considering Hector's intelligence had only recently gleaned the information. Roman casually mentioned that his own sources had already hinted at the possibility, given the clear advantage one could see in a conflict between Hector and Cairo. However, Roman questioned why he should entertain Hector's proposal. Edwin, taken aback, inquired if Roman was outright rejecting his offer. Roman clarified that his concern lay with Hector's capability to propose such a pact, given their current predicament. With Hector cornered and struggling to rehabilitate their arid lands, the limited aid from the Heavenly Palace wasn't sufficient for Edwin to fully address the issue. Cutting to the chase, Roman urged Edwin to skip redundant explanations and instead focus on why he should consider an alliance. With a penetrating gaze, Roman pressed Edwin to justify the merits of their collaboration. Edwin's expression shifted to one of surprise, then he countered Roman's skepticism by acknowledging Hector's current vulnerability. However, he couldn't grasp why Roman would engage in a war where Hector would merely be an adjunct to Roman's efforts. Edwin speculated that Hector's plan seemed to align too neatly with the Dimitri's agenda of forging alliances among kingdoms. Roman conceded Edwin's point, affirming that unity was imperative in the face of the common adversary, the Empire. Yet, he probed Edwin further, questioning his faith in the kingdom alliance and whether he could commit to it until the end. Roman hinted at his own ability to dismantle such alliances, likening them to fragile sand castles. In a philosophical tone, Roman reflected on the complexities of human relationships, emphasizing the inherent mistrust humans harbor towards outsiders, contrasting it with the trust they place in their own circles. Roman elaborated further, painting a picture of the Umberto kingdom's precarious position on the front lines, facing the looming threat of Kronos. He emphasized the toll of continuous losses on Umberto, destabilizing its internal affairs. With Umberto's vulnerability laid bare, Roman expressed his intent to exploit it, aiming to coax Umberto out of the Kingdom Alliance. He delved into the woes of Redford, where the king's penchant for gambling had depleted the nation's coffers. Even attempts by his vassals to salvage the situation had led them to seek aid from the Golden Bank. Roman hinted at the possibility that betrayal might be the only solution for the debt-stricken Redford. Roman questioned whether Edwin believed Frank and Odelia, the other members of the Alliance, were any different. Both kingdoms had long-standing grievances with Cairo, yet while Cairo had achieved stability by purging its factions, Roman doubted that Frank and Odelia could replicate such resolution. He underscored the vulnerability of the four kingdoms within the alliance, easy targets for Kronos aggression. Edwin's surprise lingered as Roman extended his analysis to include Hector. Yet, Edwin couldn't help but acknowledge the truth in Roman's assessment. The Kingdom Alliance was indeed fragile, its collapse imminent, like a sandcastle at the mercy of the tide. Roman asserted that unlike other kingdoms, Hector's intentions seemed genuine, driven by a desire for revenge against Kronos. However, he questioned whether Hector held any tangible value in its weakened state. Roman pressed Edwin once more, challenging him to justify why the Demetris should align with Hector. Edwin's response was laced with a mixture of resignation and acceptance of the grim reality. He acknowledged the cruelty of the situation, recognizing that Hector's internal decay was inevitable. However, he argued that Hector's determination for revenge couldn't be dismissed, even if they weren't fit to lead the charge. Edwin countered Roman's inquiry with a somber reminder that wars demanded sacrifices, even from the Demetris. In the harsh calculus of conflict, there would inevitably be those who served as sacrificial lambs to pave the way forward. Edwin made a solemn vow that Hector would always occupy the forefront of the impending war. He contrasted Hector's resolute stance with the superficial appearance of unity within the Kingdom Alliance, suggesting to Roman that an alliance with Hector, driven by a clear objective, would be more advantageous. Roman's response was a smirking acknowledgement, followed by a cryptic reminder for Edwin to recall the commitment he had just made. As Edwin departed, he reflected on his initial encounter with Roman on the battlefield, realizing he had encountered an unpredictable force that he had never encountered before. Despite his tireless efforts in the Heavenly Palace, 
Edwin recognized Roman as an unexpected variable, a status he aspired to achieve himself. Edwin harbored confidence that Hector would evolve into a force stronger than its current state. Meanwhile, Roman observed the burgeoning power emanating from Edwin, recognizing a significant transformation. Even if Hector contained only Edwin within its ranks, Roman deemed it valuable enough to integrate into his plans. A week later, the scene shifted to the Lawrence Palace, where Flora conversed with an elderly mage. She recounted the aftermath of the recent battle in Cairo, explaining how Roman Dimitri had dismantled Benedict's castle to swiftly suppress the rebel army. Flora noted the risks inherent in Roman's decisive action, warning that prolonged conflict would have likely drawn in the Empire faction to bolster the rebellion's ranks. The elderly mage nodded in understanding, attributing Roman's bold move to the influence of the Phoenix Magic Tower. He emphasized the strategic imperative of quashing the rebellion swiftly, as allowing it to persist would only benefit their adversaries. Turning to Flora, he sought her opinion on Roman's choice to open the castle gates. In response, Flora questioned the necessity of endangering the Western front line with such a risky maneuver. The old man concurred with Flora's assessment, acknowledging the perilous nature of Roman's decision. Nevertheless, he revealed Roman's confidence in his ability to vanquish Knight Captain Gustavo, underpinning his audacious strategy. The old man imparted to Flora a profound truth. War was a realm where experiences unattainable in books were forged. He explained that even perilous decisions or situations could sometimes be the catalyst for turning the tide of battle. He emphasized the thin line between recklessness and boldness, underscoring how, in this conflict, Roman Dimitri's prowess was instrumental in shaping the outcomes. Flora found herself taken aback by this insight. As the scene transitioned to the exterior of the castle, Count Lawrence approached Flora. He expressed his understanding of Flora's desire to learn war tactics and offered heartfelt encouragement. Yet, despite his support, Count Lawrence couldn't conceal his apprehension about Flora's decision to head to the Western front line. With genuine concern, Count Lawrence confessed to Flora that not a day had passed without him fearing for her safety. He pleaded with her to reconsider and return home. In response, Flora reassured her father explaining that her time on the Western front line had enriched her with invaluable experiences. Each time the Kronos Empire breached Cairo's borders, devastation followed in its wake. Flames consumed the land, and lives were lost. In those harrowing moments, Flora felt powerless, compelled to witness the horrors of war unfold before her eyes. She realized that war had ceased to be a distant concept. It had become an undeniable reality. Determined to confront this reality head-on, Flora resolved to immerse herself in every facet of the conflict, seeking growth and understanding with each experience. She knew that she must prepare herself fully for the trials ahead. Turning to her father, Flora made her intentions clear. She intended to enlist in the Dimitri's army. The scene transitioned to Roman's office, where Chris inquired about Roman's intentions regarding Flora. Roman regarded Flora as a valuable asset but he hesitated to integrate her into his army immediately. He instructed Chris to convey to Flora that if she participated in a week of rigorous training and proved her suitability for the Dimitri's army, he would officially accept her. Chris acknowledged Roman's directive, but inwardly he grappled with the realization that this offer was tantamount to rejection in his mind. As dawn broke, the training grounds bustled with activity as Dimitri soldiers engaged in their morning run. Among them, Flora pushed herself to keep pace, incredulous at the hour-long duration of the run. She found the intensity overwhelming, but she held on to the hope that it would soon conclude. However, to her astonishment, the soldiers continued to run without respite. Chris announced that soldiers would be ranked based on their arrival order, urging them to give their utmost effort. Flora's determination surged as she braced herself for the demanding challenge ahead. As the soldiers and Chris picked up their pace, Flora found herself lagging behind, struggling to keep up. Pausing to catch her breath, she realized that the soldiers had no choice but to press on. After completing the run, Chris addressed the soldiers, urging them to abandon the notion that they would always enter battle fully prepared. He stressed the importance of pushing themselves to their limits every day, emphasizing that stamina training was essential for all, regardless of rank. 
He underscored the necessity of building endurance to navigate diverse terrains and endure until the end. Finally completing her running training, Flora couldn't shake the feeling that Chris's words had been directed at her. However, she took solace in the fact that she had already undertaken her own stamina training prior to joining the Dimitris. Enduring a one-hour warm-up run and a mountain run of equal duration constituted her basic training regimen. As Chris announced the next phase of training, sword sparring, Flora steeled herself for the challenge ahead. Amidst the flurry of sparring soldiers, Chris offering words of wisdom. He emphasized the importance of efficiency in combat, highlighting the pivotal moment when fatigue became an adversary as heavy as any chain. It was then, he declared, that the true test of skill began. Meanwhile, Flora found herself resting under the cool shade of a tree, observing the soldiers training with surprise. She marveled at the intensity of the Dimitri soldier's routine, contrasting it with the belief that excessively harsh training breeds discontent. Yet, the soldiers before her seemed to exude enthusiasm rather than resentment. Despite her initial astonishment, Flora resolved not to falter. She acknowledged that adapting to the rigorous stamina training would take time, but she remained steadfast in her determination. Giving up was not an option. Days later, the scene shifted to the training grounds under Roman's command. As Chris reported to Roman, he praised Flora's unwavering determination to complete the training despite her stamina limitations. While her archery skills exceeded the average, Flora struggled in close combat and needed improvement in that regard. Chris also highlighted Flora's remarkable success in combat strategy training on the third day, where she emerged victorious in nine out of ten encounters, often employing unexpected tactics. Curious, Roman queried Chris about his perspective on Flora's value to the Dimitri faction. Without hesitation, Chris affirmed his belief that Flora Lawrence was indeed an asset the Dimitri faction required. Upon hearing Chris's confidence in Flora, Roman couldn't help but smirk, acknowledging the potential significance of her presence. Meanwhile, the narrative transitioned to the Dimitri Castle alleyway, where Thomas accidentally collided with a cloaked figure named Sierra. The Kronos commander and a Korch vice master stepped forward with purpose. She instructed his subordinates to proceed with their plan that very night, urging them to remain discreet and gather intelligence on the Dimitri's security measures. Hidden in the shadows, Sierra's subordinates nodded in silent acknowledgement. The scene shifted to the Dimitri Plaza, where Sierra sat on a bench, assessing the formidable security measures in place. She hadn't anticipated the level of energy exhibited by the Dimitri's ordinary soldiers, likening it to that of knights. Sierra contemplated the risks involved, acknowledging the perilous nature of their mission. Survival within Dimitri's territory was far from guaranteed. One of Sierra's subordinates approached, reporting their observations of the iron mine. They cautioned Sierra that if their plans went awry, the Dimitri's security could be mobilized within a mere five minutes. Furthermore, they emphasized the presence of numerous skilled individuals within the territory, advising Sierra and his team to exercise heightened caution. Upon hearing his subordinates' report, Sierra pondered the extent of the Dimitri's preparation in response to the Kronos Empire's declared assassination plan. She found the situation intriguing, contemplating the thrill of successfully bypassing the defenses to reach Roman Dimitri. Such an achievement promised an exhilarating experience beyond words. With resolve, Sierra instructed her subordinates to inform the rest of the guild members that the plan would proceed as scheduled without deviation. As night fell, all the guild members assembled, ready to execute their mission. Addressing his comrades, Sierra set a tight time frame of 15 minutes to infiltrate the castle. She asserted her leadership role, confident in their abilities. Despite Roman Dimitri's prowess on the battlefield, Sierra believed that her guild members were the true predators of the night. Enveloped in their magic artifact and visibility cloaks, Sierra and her cohorts stealthily advanced towards the entrance of the Dimitri Castle, poised to strike. As Sierra spotted two soldiers patrolling nearby, she seized the opportunity to strike. Moving swiftly, she attempted to launch a surprise attack from behind. However, to her astonishment, one of the soldiers managed to block Sierra's assault with deft skill. In a swift motion, the soldier activated a magical signal, alerting others to the presence of intruders near the castle walls. Realizing they had been discovered, both soldiers prepared to engage Sierra in combat. 
Sierra stood frozen, stunned by the realization that their infiltration had been compromised.